So I'm happy to introduce Olga Troyanskaya, our first scientific keynote. Uh, Olga went to college at the University of Richmond. She was in Russia until she was 16. Uh, she went to the University of Richmond. I remember, re uh, so I, let me jump a little bit. She then came to Stanford and worked in my lab. I'll get to that in a second. But I remember very well her letters. The people at the University of Richmond were falling all over themselves about how this uh, young Russian uh, girl at the time, then a young woman, uh, just uh, blew them all away. And it was kind of, you know, one of these great easy decisions to accept her. She came to Stanford in biomedical informatics uh, and joined my lab, I'll talk about that in a second, did her PhD, uh, and then I believe went directly to a faculty position at uh, Princeton in computer science and their Institute for Genomics. Uh, in the intervening uh, 18 or so years, she has also become, um, uh, uh, had an appointment at the Simons Institute. And so she has, is both at Simons and at Princeton, uh, where she does great work, some of which we will hear about in a moment. Um, so my first memory of Olga meeting her, so of course I remember reading her application, was at the uh, retreat. We had a retreat in the fall, and that's where we met all the first year students. And I don't know if she remembers this, but we found ourselves dancing the cha-cha together. Uh, she's a very good dancer, and I don't remember who came up to who. I'm really hoping it was the new student coming to the faculty, so that's what I'm gonna go with, and said, let's dance the cha-cha. And so I remember thinking, wow, okay, here's a first year student, and she's dancing the cha-cha with me, and she was very good. Um, she joined my lab. Um, she worked uh, with, also with David Botstein. So she had two advisors, which is always, a, of course, a pleasure for the student. Um, and David was in, was a, is a yeast geneticist and an enthusiast about uh, informatics and computing. And I was an actual informatics and computing person. And between the two of us, we basically just watched Olga do her thing. There wasn't a lot of advising. There was a lot of watching. And she did great work on... Um, Bayesian methods for data integration and, and at the time looking at yeast protein-protein uh, interactions. But during that time, she did something very valuable for both of us. She wrote a paper about imputing missing data in expression data sets. And I have been aware of this for many years. This is my number one cited patient paper. Uh, something like 4,000 citations in Google. Uh, and I just checked, it's also your number one. I said, wouldn't it be cool if it's my number one, but it's not even her number one. She has like a million better. But both of us have, so we're, we're linked forever with this paper. And I love that as a data scientist, informatician, my number one paper is about how to make up fake data, right? <laughs> That's the bottom line. That's what imputation is. And the, my number one contribution is how to trick everybody and, and make up fake data. Thank you very much for that citation. Um, she is the fourth uh, PhD graduate from my lab, and I, I'm, uh, I'm compulsive enough that I keep track of this. And so I have 34 graduates, and she was number four. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome Olga to uh, PSB and give her the traditional uh, PSB uh, lay. Oh, cool. And take it away, Olga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russ, and thank you to all the organizers for inviting me. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I will keep my mask on, although I have multiple people stationed throughout the room to immediately alert me if it's not clear. So you too can alert me and I will adjust. Um, but uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be here in person. I don't know if I can beat uh, Russ's incredible introduction, but I'll try. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about um, decoding the genome uh, to uncover the molecular basis of human disease. So really, I think for this audience, I really don't have to sell this uh, vision, but I think perhaps the most fundamental question in biomedicine is really being able to connect the genomes to phenotypes, right? Including all of the environment, et cetera. So true molecular understanding of human disease really requires us to fully map specific variants, both within genes and outside genes, right? to their biochemical and then phenotypic effects in the context of specific environment. And we have to do it through understanding their effects on cell type and tissue specific molecular circuits. Now, if we can actually truly do that, right, what we really hope to do is that we would be able to live in a world where our diagnosis, treatment, and even drug development would be able to be done 
through predictive models, right? And eventually even mechanistic, potentially predictive models, right? Of human disease. Now, that would allow us to really study both, you know, look at personalized medicine as well as actually study fundamental biological processes, right? From development to evolution in this context, right? So how do we get there? How can we actually make this world a reality? And I think, you know, in this conference, that's really what we're thinking about. And this is my view of how we can go essentially from this simplified formula of data plus model equals true predictive knowledge in the context of precision medicine truly based on our personalized genomes. And I think what we really need to do to develop these predictive models is we need to be able to look at molecular, cellular, and organismal systems, right? So across scales. Um, and we need to be able to integrate across these levels of resolution to really go all the way from molecular biology and the genomes all the way to organismal physiology. I will not get there in this talk. Hopefully you, you realize this. But I do want to show you what I think are the steps that we need to take and give you some you know, really vignettes of projects that my group has been working with together with incredible collaborators from all over the US and the world uh, in trying to address every one of those steps. And I think as a community, many of you are working at different points in this continuum, and I'm really hoping that, you know, in a decade when we're here for PSB, oh gosh, 2031, is that right? 2032, there we go. Um, perhaps we can actually start really thinking about integrating across these skills in a true way uh, in a predictive model. Uh, so I think the first thing that we really need to do is we need to be able to predict with high precision effect of any variant in the genome, be it in the genes or a regulatory variant outside of the genes, right, in a specific context. And of course, we need to be able to predict the biochemical level effects, right, the epigenetic effects, and all the way to phenotypic effects. Then we need to be able to start modeling perturbations, be that molecular perturbations, right? So genetic perturbations, environmental perturbations, right? How would the effect of a particular drug manifest itself in a particular cell type in a particular genomic context? We then need to be able to integrate all of this information and models across the various scales, right? So we might have an amazing model for a particular cell type, but can we transfer this information Let's say if it's a, you know, proximal epithelial tubule sense of the kidney, can we then understand what it means for the entire kidney uh, in a particular environmental context again? And then finally, we really need to be able to integrate all of these different measurements and scales, so dynamic snapshot data, et cetera, and really predict, have unified predictive models. So I want to give you some vignettes of how we're thinking about this, and the first one is really just this fundamental ability to decode the genomes. So far, uh, the vast majority of disease genetics has really focused on genes. So here I'm showing it as these uh, four axons, the tip of the iceberg, right? And so there's a reason for this, right? Both in terms of that that's easier to study, but also those mutations do tend to be by far the more powerful in terms of their impact on directly on the phenotype. But in reality, this is a much more complex picture, right? So protein coding genes account for less than 2% of the genome, and the rest of the 98% are in a large part responsible for regulation, both transcriptional regulation, regulating when those genes are expressed, and post-transcriptional regulation, right? So for example, mRNA splicing, transport, stability, et cetera, right? So there's an incredibly, nice, this is not news for any of you, obviously, um, but I really want to emphasize 98%, right, that we've been largely ignoring because it is really hard to study. And so the reason that it's so hard to study is that the search space here is just incredibly vast, right? As computational people, this is not surprising to us, and I know some of you in the audience work exactly on these problems. We're talking about 98% of three billion letters, and of course, there's combinatorial issues, right? And some of these variants have manifest only in a particular genomic background, et cetera. So what we need is to be able to have an equivalent of the genetic code that we have that tells us in any molecular biology of the cell, right? Molecular biology or genetics textbook, it tells us how do variants affect the encoding for amino acids, right? 
We need the equivalent of that for the regulatory code, basically. And this is not easy. The key challenge that is that even if all of these individuals have the same exact disease, the underlying variants that may predispose them for this disease might be completely different. And again, we're in the search space of 98% of 3 billion letters, and it might be a combination of those variants that's actually causing different effects. So essentially, our supervised or traditional statistical approaches are going to fail even if we deeply sequence and deeply phenotype whole populations, right? I would even argue, honestly, if we sequence and deeply phenotype the whole world, we're still no, not going to get with statistical significance every single rare variant, because some of them also might be embryonic lethal in the vast majority of contexts, but pop up in just the right genomic context and still have effects on a disease. So what we need is essentially this regulatory code, right, where in the coding variant, we know we can look up in this you know, pretty little map what the effect will be of switching this G for an A or a T. And, you know, of course, I'm slightly oversimplifying. There's a huge and very interesting question of studying missense mutations. But for the vast majority of these mutations, we do have at least some understanding of what it would affect. And there is other uh, programs and approaches that are, have been really powerful in looking at, for example, how a particular mutation affects the three-dimensional structure of proteins, et cetera. In fact, uh, I've learned about some of them in my PhD at Russell's group. Uh, but we need something where we can take any non-coding variant, right, even one that has never been encountered in any study, and be able to predict how it would affect the epigenetic structure, right, so, and then expression, right? We want to be able to say this A to C change in this location in the genome in the middle of nowhere on chromosome 7 is going to reduce expression of this protein, right? And then we want to be able to have a phenotypic prediction, and it is actually going to be not just functional in that it affects this protein, but it also is pathogenic. Because some of these variants might be completely non-functional, right? You can change this A to T and it will have zero effect to anything. Some of them might actually change binding of a particular transcription factor, but be benign, right? Maybe it you know, affects, means that I have curly hair, but stra has straight hair. But others, you don't have straight hair, you have curly Okay, Russ doesn't have hair. All right, there we go. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, others might actually predict that we have higher predisposition for Alzheimer's. And that's what we need to be able to do. And it turns out that deep learners, um, machine learning with deep learning, uh, is actually quite powerful for this specific problem. So deep learners can actually accurately predict impact of these regulatory variants both at the transcriptional level, so I'll tell you a little bit more about our specific uh, program, which is called uh, Deep C, and at the post-transcriptional level. So in our case, it's uh, uh, the Sequeaver method that can predict effects of variants for you know, anything from splicing to RNA stability. And critically, these models do not need to learn on any mutational data. So I know I'm overemphasizing this, but this is really critical in that we need to be able to predict any variant with single nucleotide resolution. And as soon as you start learning on mutational data, you're basically learning only common variants that you actually can find enough times in your cohort. So just to give you an intuition of how this works, so we use convolutional neural networks. Uh, there's actually other approaches like transformers that may actually become uh, even more powerful for this, but I'll tell you the intuition is very similar, uh, right? So. The first point why uh, CNNs are useful is the hierarchical structure, right? The hierarchical structure of CNNs allows us to capture the context information on DNA, right? So the learner slides along the genome. We don't use any uh, variant information to learn. So we use just one genome. We use the reference genome, but honestly, you can use any human genome. And then we use a large number of regulatory sequences, so basically cheap seq databases, right? So transcription factor information, histone marks, uh, and DNA hypersensitivity information. And of course, the, what's really important is that genome doesn't actually match any of those experiments, right? And the experiments could be tissue and cell type specific, so you can actually learn these models in a tissue and cell type specific context. But it's well, it's actually philosophically interesting. It's an unsupervised approach with respect to variants, but you can argue that it's somewhat supervised along the genome. So the model slides along the genome, right? And it's seen what is really allowing you to learn is that as it's sliding along this genome, it's seen many examples 
of that transcription factor binding site, or what sequence is really telling it to have a particular histone mark, right? So even though the genome doesn't match any of the functional readouts that you have, along, you know, when you see enough examples of it, those learners are able to capture what in the sequence is actually underlying those features. And of course, for that, the hierarchical structure is very important because as we know in DNA, the context is quite important, how these features are related next to each other. Of course, that brings us to the interaction of sequence features, right? We know that some transcription factor binding information is going to be in how the histone marks are arranged around that area, right? And that's the sort of information that this model is learning. In fact, it would be great to dig under the hood and figure out what exactly it learned because it's really learning the biology and the signaling beyond what we can often know from our knowledge of regulatory epigenetics and genetics. And finally, uh, we set this up as a multi-tax prediction. So really the output layer shares all the inputs so we get even more power because of course for some cell types and tissues, we have a lot more data and for others we have less. And therefore the model is able to use the information for those tissues and cell types for which there is a lot of information to improve its predictions, if it's relevant of course, for the rarer cell types and tissues. So it turns out this actually works quite well. I'm very happy if you guys have questions to show you graphs and tell you why we think it works quite well. I will just show you. It's been very widely used uh, by many studies. My very favorite of everything, just from phylogenetic, polygenic disease risk to cancer, I think somewhere, blood pressure. My favorite one is this eyebrow thickness uh, study. I hope, <laughs> you know, I do actually find this uh, kind of fun. But in any case, every, uh, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And uh, you know, as you can see, they're quite widely used. And what we're actually pushing now on the technological front is really being able to um, both make this, you know, hierarchical architecture development, both make it more systematic and also more, you know, really democratic. So right now, the way that you know architectures are developed is basically somebody like my graduate student or one of your postdocs, you know, essentially comes up with the parameters, and then we run optimizations and we try to make the parameters perform better and eventually you end up with a model and you decide how you know exactly what the model might look like. Uh, so uh, Frank Zhang, who is actually on the market, who is really an amazing postdoc in my group, uh, he actually has developed uh, an approach called Ember for automatic design of these neural network architectures. So he optimized the neural network architecture search approach for biology. And it turns out that actually the architectures that Amber can learn are as accurate or more accurate than the ones that are human expert designed, but of course more systematically designed automatically by the system, and actually quite fast as well. So you can say, in, for example, how much it can search in a reasonably fast approach. So I won't get into too much on Amber. It is published, but I just wanted to tell you that it's out there. So what I do want to tell you about is, so how can we use it? So what we were really interested in doing is now that hopefully I've convinced you that this is valuable and can be accurate, and of course there's now a huge number of uh, deep learning approaches for these problems, can we actually use it to study a hard, challenging disease question that hasn't been able to be answered before? And indeed, so one of the large open questions was the role, of, if there is a role, of uh, non-coding, de novo non-coding regulatory variants actually in any complex human disease. So that was a huge open question. And by de novo non-coding regulatory variants, I mean variants that are not, you know, not affecting your genes but are affecting the regulation, right? So transcriptional or post-transcriptional. And de novo just means that it's genetic, but your parents don't have them, right? So it's something that you, it's not inherited. It's something that you have in your DNA but your parents didn't. And um, it was a huge, you know, there were a lot of signs that the regulatory variants might affect things in complex human disease, but really there was none of the approaches that have, people have tried to prove that this was happening were working. And the way you actually prove it in quantitative genetics is that you literally look at patients with the disease, you sequence them, you look at patients without the disease, you sequence them, you control as much as possible. I mean, ideally, twin studies, we have siblings, but you know, even just patients. And then you want to say, well, I have a significant enrichment of the variants of the type that I'm trying to associate with disease. Uh, 
in my disease individuals versus my controls. And that's precisely what people were trying to do in autism, I mean, or in a number of complex human diseases, and they couldn't find enough of a statistical significance. Because of course, again, three billion letters, or 98% of three billion letters, huge search space, very hard to get statistical significance. And autism is, of course, an important disease in and of itself. It's highly prevalent, but it's also a case study for whether this could be proven anywhere. And in fact, right before our paper actually came out, there was a paper that came out in Science on the same exact cohort that I'll show you in a second, looking at these, this exact setup, and in fact, they were smarter than that. They actually said, well, what if we just, didn't, don't just look at all the variants that are regulatory, but we overlap, for example, cheap seek information. We only take the variants that are inside cheap seek peaks, or we only take variants that are close to known autism genes, or we only take variants that are in promoters, or we only take variants that are close to you know, conserved genes that are more likely to be diseased. So that's what each of those dots is. You can see that this is, if you look at all the variants, these, all these dots are all the many ways that they've tried to select functional variants, and not a single one of them gets even close to significance once you control for multiple hypothesis testing. And so what we wanted to do is flip this on its side and say, well, we have these models. We have DeepC and Seekweaver. And they don't know anything about autism, but they know how to predict which variants are likely to be functional and disease associated, right? So what if we just see, instead of counting how many variants a child with autism has versus, in this case, this is a very well-controlled cohort. It's a, what's called a quad design. So we have pro bands, the kids with autism, and we have whole genome sequencing also for their unaffected siblings and for the father and the mother. So we can actually control and say, well, is there not just an enrichment in the number of variants in the proband versus the sibling? And it turns out there's no significant enrichment. So the red bar is how many on average regulatory mutations we see in the children with autism in red versus their unaffected siblings in gray. And you can see it's basically the same. There's no significant difference. But what if the kids with autism, their mutations are worse, right? They're more disruptive. And since I'm talking about it, you can probably tell what the answer is going to be. So it turns out, indeed, at all, even at the whole genome level, right, without subsetting to anything, we see a significant difference in how disruptive the regulatory variants are predicted to be by our deep learners, both at the transcriptional level and same thing as post-transcriptional. And you see that this difference actually is just as significant, but the difference does increase quantitatively as you look at genes that are more likely to be disease, you know, variants close to genes that are more likely to be disease associated, so loss of function intolerant, as well as genes that are, have either a known link or a predicted link to autism. So this was the first proof that indeed non-coding de novo variants, regulatory variants, are in fact playing a causal role in complex human disease, in this case in autism. And since we're, then we actually have done this in collaboration with others, uh, looking at um, congenital heart disease, and we're working on, on this in cancer, and the congenital heart disease, we saw basically the same story, that indeed regulatory variants do have a significant impact uh, in, oops, where's this one? There we go. And we actually have experimentally shown that a number of these variants with high predicted impact do indeed impact, do indeed drive expression in a differential way between the allele for the sibling versus the proband. So this is, you know, here we're actually, of course, this is in tissue culture, this is not in humans, right? Uh, but this is looking at the disease, the allele, you know, the single letter change between the autism child, child with autism and their unaffected sibling, and just switching that one single nucleotide causes differential expression in this uh, particular assay. Uh, and in fact, 94% of the variants that we tested did show us this uh, significant difference. So these would be very interesting candidates for future studies, perhaps in mouse, et cetera. Now, on the post-transcriptional, this was, of course, transcriptional. On the post-transcriptional level, our collaborator, Bob Darnell's group at Rockefeller, actually looked at specifically an ASD proband-specific variant in SMEC1. So SMEC1 is a very important serine threonine kinase. It's uh, highly conserved, so clearly is important. Has never before this study been associated with autism in any way. Uh, we found that indeed, as predicted by Seekweaver, this 
particular variant would cause an ASD proben, so autism-specific reduction in the long isoform of SMEC1. And that's, you know, you can see this in the gels, but you also can see this in the bar graph. What's perhaps even more important is here we can actually connect things all the way to phenotype. I'll just be completely honest. It's very hard to take things all the way to phenotype. Uh, A, because regulatory variants, each separate variant actually, of course, has less of an impact on both epigenetics and phenotype, right? It's good for us because we all carry a lot of variants around that are regulatory, right? Again, 98% of 3 billion liters, so we don't want them to be highly impactful. But as a group, we actually have shown, you know, with some assumptions, we can show that the impact of these regulatory variants is actually quite comparable to the impact of de novo uh, coding variants. And then actually at the post-transcriptional level, in the next study that I'll tell you about, in fact, we show that there are even, at least in mental health diseases, there are actually even higher impact than the coding variants for inherited variants there. But here we can actually take it all the way to phenotype. There's actually enough of a statistical power in that we found that low proband IQ, so low IQ specifically in autistic kids, is significantly associated with high impact of dysregulation at this post-transcriptional regulatory level, right? So for autistic kids, if they have a higher rate of hits at the post-transcriptional level, like this variant, that is a significant association with their IQ. So that takes us to the next level, right? So we've talked about decoding of genomes, but can we actually think further going all the way from these genomic impacts to thinking about them as perturbations? And I'm going to really go a little bit more deeply into the dysregulation at the target site level for RNA binding proteins. So, so far I've just talked about post-transcriptional impact and waved my hands at it, but what I actually really mean is thinking about RNA binding proteins, which uh, unless you study RNA, you might not have thought about very deeply, but they're incredibly important. Uh, they are, regulate every aspect of RNA metabolism, so splicing, transport, you know, stability, anything, right? Of course, they're even more going to be extremely important in the brain where you, as you can imagine, just because of the structure of neurons as cells, for example, transport is incredibly important, right, if you need to get something to the axon. So RBPs regulate all of RNA metabolism, and they've been previously associated very strongly with many different mental health diseases at the level of variants that impact the actual RNA binding protein, right? So variants that hit fMRP, for example, is one famous one you might have heard about, uh, are involved in intellectual disability, they've been associated with autism, et cetera. What I'm talking about is not that. Right? So that means that you can have a hit on one of those RNA binding proteins, you know, a few hundred nucleotides, et cetera. But of course, there's the entire rest of the genome. And what you could actually have is target sites. So you might actually have a perfectly functional RNA binding protein, but you might have mutations in where it's supposed to bind, right, at the target sites. And so now your perfectly functional, I'll just use fMRP as the example, is no longer going to bind there. So are those regulatory variants also important? And that's the question that we want to ask. So we have those non-coding non variants. Can we estimate how are they going to affect the ability of RNA binding protein to bind and regulate uh, that mRNA? And then is that associated with a psychiatric disorder risk? And this is work of uh, Chris Park, uh, who is really an incredible scientist in my group and uh, really conceived this entire project and led it. Uh, and again, in collaboration with Bob Dornell at Rockefeller. So uh, what Chris is doing is he's going to use his Seekweaver model, right, that's specific. So he has a number of models, 200 some models, each of them trained for a particular RNA binding protein, right? So these are deep learners, like I just showed you, trained for post-transcriptional effect prediction. Each model is specific for RNA binding protein. They're trained on in vivo data, these clip assays, which actually is important. So uh, what he's going to do is he's going to take, you know, the original allele from the reference genome versus the mutation allele, and now we're going to look at hereditary uh, mutations. So we're looking at GWAS data, right? And for each of those SNPs, we're going to predict the probability of RNA, uh, of the RNA binding protein binding to the reference allele versus alternative allele. And the difference between these two basically gives us an estimate of how disruptive that variant is, right? So it's actually, once you have the deep learner, it's actually a pretty simple uh, calculation. And of course, then all you have to do is figure out if there's a significant statistical association between the pathogenic impact, that's just coming from the GWAS studies directly, right, 
and the estimated RBP dysregulation, which is coming from the deep learner. And so in this, this is exactly what we're looking at, right? So just focus on one graph. We're looking at on the x-axis is the pathogenic impact coming directly from GWAS. We're looking at the psychiatric disorder consortia DRAS. So there's five diseases, ADHD, autism, bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia. And on the y-axis is the estimated impact of dysregulation from the deep learner. And what we're looking for is, for each dot here is one of those models, so one RBP. So we're looking, are there any dots above the false discovery rate of 0.05? And the first thing that you can see is that for every one of those diseases, there are actually quite a few dots. So quite a number of RBPs have a significant association between dysregulation of those RBP functions at the level of target site dysregulation, right? So again, the proteins are totally fine, but they just can't bind where they're supposed to, and psychiatric disorder risk. And what was actually, I have to say, Chris, so Chris trained for his postdoc with Bob Dornell and even did all of these clip assays, which are incredibly painful experiments to do, like really hard experiments to do. So he, you know, I asked him afterwards, I was blown away by this particular fact that when he compares this, I, I don't have the graph in the talk, but when he actually compares the extent of this impact at the regulatory level to the extent of all the coding variants, it's significantly larger, the non-coding impact, than the coding variants in this case. And I, I told him, I was like, Chris, this is incredible. Like, do you agree? Like, were you surprised? And he was like, no, I kind of expected. So I guess people in the RNA world actually aren't that surprised, but I think this is really pointing out that we really need to be looking at both coding. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at coding. We just need to be looking at coding and regulatory variants if we really want to interpret heritability um, and impact of genetics and human disease. Um, and, you know, the second point, of course, is you can see how broad this is. This is across all of these different diseases, mental health diseases. The next sort of question that I think you probably are thinking about, or at least uh, I really thought was critical, is that brings us to a question of two worlds. So hopefully I've convinced you regulatory variants are important. But the next fundamental question is, if they're important, we have two worlds, right? In one world, they're important, but they impact different pathways in a different way than coding variants. And then in my very official capacity, I will tell you we're kind of screwed, right? Because we need to develop totally different treatment options, right? Like we really need to figure this out from scratch. I mean, we could do it, but it would be a really hard world to live in. Or there's another world, which is still hard, but a lot better for us. And that's the world where those regulatory variants are affecting the same types of pathways as the coding variants. So the risk is converged. And I think a priori, we don't know. So I still don't know hardcore what the answer is generally, but I can tell you that we've looked at this in the context of autism, and we've looked at this in the context of this study across mental health disorders. And so far, it's very encouraging. In both cases, we do see the convergence of risk. And so I'll show you actually Examples, so for example, here is one RNA binding protein, A2D2. And indeed, you know, this is showing that this model is significantly associated with pathogenic dysregulation in this target sites of this protein are significantly associated with pathogenic risk for inherited variants in ADHD, bipolar, and schizophrenia. And in fact, if you look actually at the protein sequence, there's a huge number of documented mutations affecting the coding region of the protein that are linking it, oh look, birds are here, uh, that are linking it all the way uh, to a number of developmental and intellectual disorders. And we see this, I've just shown you one example, but we see this for a large number of proteins. And in the autism case, we actually have a quantitative, proof is too strong of a world, but a quantitative demonstration of this uh, being significant. So, I'm very hopeful that while it's not going to be easy figuring out both the coding and the regulatory risk, and of course then integrating all of these together in the specific genomic and environmental context, at least it's very likely that the risk is going to have effect on the same pathways, or at least similar pathways, so that will make it a lot easier in terms of both figuring out what's going on, understanding how it affects cell type and tissue specific and organ and physiological networks, and also hopefully developing drugs and being able to repurpose drugs. So next, I really want you to think about 
thinking across time and scale, right? So of course, all of this isn't happening and it's, you know, separately just in the genome at this molecular level. All of this is happening in the longitudinal context. It's happening across scales. It's having, you know, that genetic impact is going all the way to the physiological and clinical impact. And that brings me to uh, a story that I've sadly is still very relevant to us. I was kind of hoping by now it would be less relevant, but it is still very relevant, and that's COVID-19. So my lab in the past, as probably many of you in the past couple of years, has focused on a, a lot on looking at uh, COVID data. And one of the questions we've been very interested in looking at together with a wonderful collaborator we have at Mount Sinai, Stuart Silphone, and a huge group uh, on this project is understanding sex differences in COVID-19. So, you know, this is very, actually very, turns out very timely, re quite recently, there was another article on this. Um, and you've probably heard that, you know, men are at much higher risk of adverse outcomes for COVID-19. Uh, if you haven't, now you have. But it is, it's a very well-documented fact. I have not discovered it, right? What is uh, complicated is there's a huge number of hypotheses and the hypotheses are based on a lot of, right, like, so women do have somewhat different immune response to infection, you know, in general, and during COVID. Um, one big hypothesis is androgens, right? Like, I mean, there's even a doctor in Brazil that, that probably, I mean, the androgen is actually a very reasonable hypothesis. The, the doctor in Brazil is, you know, I wouldn't follow, but, you know, who was trying to prescribe uh, patients and treating patients with prostate cancer medications for COVID, right? There's all sorts of, you know, then there's like the obvious hypothesis of maybe it's just a side effect that men have higher rates of cardiovascular disease in general, like die earlier. So maybe it's just that. It's very hard to control for when you have aging, severe COVID cases. Um, so all sorts of things. And we uh, wanted to study this and we have this really pretty amazing cohort. So what we're studying is a group of Marines that are training, you know, they're training to become Marines on uh, Paris Island. So this is thousands of Marines basically in this, it's as controlled, I mean, I, I like to say it's pretty much as controlled environment as you get with human, large scale human studies. Uh, they're literally on this island, there's nothing else on this island but their training ground, they're completely controlled, right? They're all in the same way training. There's very strict COVID protocols, they're PCR tested weekly. And the ones who volunteer for our studies, also we have their blood weekly, uh, so we can look at the molecular level at RNA and protein with O-link. Um, and we have a pretty large group that we have this information for, so that means that we know exactly when they tested positive for COVID, and we can track them, right? And we know which RNA, so we have longitudinal RNA data matching their pre-infection, during, and post-infection. So I'm not going to use the post-infection in this particular story, uh, but it does give us this very controlled cohort with molecular measurements. And of course, they also have clinical information across all of this, both self-reported symptoms as well as nurse measured temperature. So we have a very controlled uh, measure as well. And we have pretty large numbers. Of course, it is uh, sex biased, right? Uh, there's a lot more males, but still we have 3,000 ma males and about 3, 000, uh, 300 females the, even prior to Omicron, it was pretty depressing the rate at which they were infected. So about a third of the males and more than half of the females had gotten infected in the time that we looked at the study. And so we have plenty of data that we can look at. And the question that we want to ask is, can we find molecular predictors prior to the infection that could tell us what is happening? And this cohort is actually pretty unique in addition to longitudinal part in that they're very controlled, right? These guys are all fit. They're all pretty much the same age or the same age group. They all get uh, non-severe, I mean, extremely mild COVID. No one landed in the hospital. So this is young adult, very well controlled cohort. So it takes out a lot of these covariants that we worried about in our typical population. And the first thing that we actually see is that uh, on the symptomatic level, right? Females have higher rates of every single symptom, significantly. And it's not just that they complain too much, it's really like, you know, the, the, that's, I mean, all the guys, immediately my husband's first hypothesis. Uh, anyway, uh, but, you know, they, if you look at the temperature, which is nurse measured, you know, hard, we see the same thing. It's quite clearly real. Uh, but what we see is that their viral loads are lower 
And this might be confusing, but CT value, if you haven't looked at this data, is the inversely proportional to viral load, right? So higher CT, significantly higher CT in women means significantly lower viral load. So they have less virus in them, but higher symptoms. For the clinicians, probably this is starting to make sense. And um, what we do see is the specific pathway that we really uh, started immediately focusing on is that the females show stronger molecular response to infection. So they have higher interferon simulating genes, ISGs, significantly higher level than males. And again, this is consistent. We've looked very carefully. We actually have sequences of the viruses that they're infected with. So we actually did look also at the fact whether this is just different strains and there's no bias for the strains and sort of all the obvious things, right? And we also find some sex-specific immune splicing regulation as well between men and women. So it does seem that during infection and prior to infection, this is important, the women actually have the stronger ISG levels and response. So since we have this longitudinal data encompassing pre and during infection samples, we can actually use causal mediation to understand whether there are pre-infection sex differences that might actually be explaining these clinical, molecular and clinical outcomes that we see during infection. And indeed, we do see that. So we actually see that there's significant differences between IS, specific types of ISGs that are present in women during infection that are significantly explaining what's happening at the molecular level during infection did I say prior, this month, sorry, prior to infection, that will explain what is happening during infection and that's linked to the symptoms throughout infection. I should say specifically to the viral load, what's happening, what we think is happening, just for full disclosure, this, so this is all statistically significant, this is borderline significant, but we think what's happening with viral load, is, and that is consistent with what is seen in, you know, the past, during infection and other diseases, is that women basically, because they have, they're sort of, immune systems are pre-hyped up, they're just able to clear the virus faster, right? So that causes more severe symptoms, but lower viral load, right? And that's actually consistent. But the key thing is that prior to the study, there was no way to link the pre-infection, what's happening pre-infection, to what's happening during infection. And the important part is, of course, is this something that's just specific to this young adult population? And it turns out we can actually just look at these same ISGs in other studies, right, before COVID, and look at what's happening in studies, you know, not related to infection, just, you know, different cohorts where there's expression data for older, more diverse populations, and we actually replicated in two other very large-scale studies prior to COVID, not related to any infections, that women do have a significantly higher expression level of these ISGs than men do, even for this general population that's not young or fit. So that's been really interesting, and that's really allowed us to, like being able to have this cohort that's really longitudinal has really enabled us to look at the molecular level uh, and at the level of really being able to have some causality of what is happening pre-infection to predict the outcome. And finally, of course, how am I doing this? Oh, good, perfect. All right, so finally, um, I want to really Think about how we can, you know, we're informaticians, so I'm telling you all these stories, and of course there's methods, but I sort of do want to include my, I guess, a little bit of a philosophical note. So I'm a big believer that the world has changed, right? It used to be, at least, you know, Russ said that my co-advisor was David Botstein. He's like one of the greats of genetics. And so, you know, you would have your new study, you would go to David, and you sort of use David as one big encyclopedia, right? Like, and David would have some opinion based on, you know, 17 papers that he's read throughout his life and, you know, who knows what else. And, you know, you would go to your most uh, smartest colleague or like biggest, you know, biologist and then they would figure it out, right? I think the world has changed. It's not just about how much we know, it's really about how much the data knows, right? Because there's so much information that's in the public data that we haven't actually written a paper about, right? That is not obvious from even the best analysis until you look across a huge number of data sets. So I think it used to be that every study we had to put in the context of prior literature. I think now we really need to put every new analysis in the context of prior data, right? 
And I, so that, we've been thinking about that a lot, and we really um, try to use these functional networks as one of the ways to be able to put every new analysis in the context of this prior data. So we basically have been thinking a lot of how can we take a huge number, thousands of, you know, basically every gene expression data set ever published, as well as physical interaction data, you know, other, you know, basically the kitchen sink, anything that tells us when proteins are expressed, how they're regulated, how they're interacting, um, and build tissue and cell type specific circuits. And in this case, they're not mechanistically resolved, so they're not trying to be pathways, right? They're, you know, for us, uh, computational people, they're fully connected weighted graphs that really just represent the functional context specific, so in this case tissue and cell type, but you can imagine context being disease or context being developmental stage or context being a particular condition, summary of the entirety of data. And now you can actually interpret every new study in the context of what's sitting there. So the way that we do this is, um, as Ras mentioned, we still use Bayesian approaches, although I think that it doesn't have to be Bayesian. It is just what has worked uh, well for us. It's a semi-supervised regular Bayesian, regularized Bayesian classifier. Uh, what we do is, you know, we have these thousands of, uh, this is, of course, a picture of uh, microarrays, so probably for most of you, you don't even know what this is, but, you know, RNA-seq. <laughs> Pretend like it's RNA-seq. I just have a, I like the picture. It's pretty funny. We were talking with the students, and they're like, oh, what is this? Anyway, um, and, you know, we have physical interaction data, transcription factor binding sites, et cetera. What we need to do is we need to be able to identify how useful is each of those data sets to a particular question. So if you're trying to study, let's say, um, I'm going to soon talk about, you know, a particular cell type in the brain or a particular cell type in the kidney. There's some data sets in this collection that are incredibly useful for that information, right? They might not actually be coming from that cell type, right? For example, kidneys and neurons actually have some of the same pathways. Certain types of cells in the kidneys have same pathways activated, right? Some data sets in this collection are just, you know, garbage. They're not going to be useful for anything. And then some of them are amazing data sets, but they're completely irrelevant to that particular kidney cell type, for example. So what you need to do, what we're using these uh, Bayesian classifiers for is to essentially weigh each of the data sets based on how relevant and accurate it is for that particular cell type. And so the way it weighs it is by looking at the evidence in a given data set and it's using a gold standard of what we really want is cell type specific interactions, right? So we want which two proteins, which parts of a you know, canonical pathway like let's say a kinase regulating its target, are actually happening in the particular cell type you're studying. That doesn't quite exist, so we use what I think is the next best thing. We overlay cell type or tissue-specific expression in that, let's say, cell type to the pathway. And we make an assumption that if both the kinase and its target are expressed in that cell type, and we know that that's you know, the target of that kinase, probably that the relationship is happening most of such relationships are happening in that cell type. So that's the gold things, right? Like the positives. And then the negatives are really just unrelated genes. So, you know, obviously we don't, negatives are famously not studied in biology and not published in biology. So again, next best thing, we take pairs of genes that have been studied for something else, but have never been found together, right? So either that kinase is not, and not its target, right? Or it is a kinase and its target, but they're not expressed in that tissue. One of them is expressed, the other one isn't, right? You see where it. And so the data set that's informative for that cell type will be the one where those two distributions are very far from each other. And if those two distributions fully overlap, that, that data set is useless for that particular question, right? And so that means that when you're trying to identify probability, so that gives you a weight, right? So basically, it's the same way we should really ideally do elections in this country, right? Like, you only get to vote proportionally to how good you are at understanding. <laughs> yeah, that's never going to work. Uh, but you know, in this case, we are doing the, yes, five, perfect. So we're going to get each of those weights, and then we're going to get a probability for every pair of genes ij for the entire genome, right, every possible pair. We're going to integrate all of the information, let's say how these genes are correlated, how, whether they're physically interacting in some study, weighted by the weight of you know, the confidence value, the, the weight that the data set got from this process. And so you know, then there is a semi-supervised version of this that actually allows you to 
do even better by using predicted probabilities of interactions in this process, but I'm not going to go into it unless you guys want to. And furthermore, we can do this across different organisms, and so then you can actually use these networks also to transfer knowledge in a fully molecularly based data-driven way, not just a semantic way across organisms. All right, so does this work? We've evaluated this computationally, experimentally out of the wazoo across different organisms. I'll just show you one example where we looked at IL-1 beta, which is a very important cytokine. Uh, our collaborators were interested in looking specifically at cardiovascular disease, so we looked specifically at blood vessel networks, right? So this is top 20 interactors of IL-1 beta predicted by this network. The network knows nothing about cardiovascular disease, right? It's trained purely on this giant collection of data without knowing what the labels for each data set are or anything. And it turns out when our collaborators tested this, uh, so at the first time point for simula stimulation of IL-1 beta, 18 out of 20 of these uh, network neighbors are significantly upregulated. And in fact, the other two are actually known interactors, but just not transcriptionally controlled. So we are predicting things correctly, but perhaps more importantly, we're predicting this in a lineage-specific manner. So actually, if you look at our predicted networks that are not, so blood vessel network is by far the most specific and accurate for this test. When you look at our other cardiovascular system-related cell types and tissues, they are sort of the next most accurate group. And then if you look at the global network or tissues that are not related to cardiovascular uh, system, they're not even close to the accuracy of these, right? Like, so same exact data. The only thing we're changing is these gold standards that I told you about, and you can get very different networks. And just very brief um, uh, way that we can use these, right? So we've used this to actually, again, understand in the COVID-19 context, why is it that patients with diabetes are at so much higher risk of COVID-19, worse outcomes of COVID-19? And in fact, specifically, um, if we look at the, you know, we can look at diabetic kidney disease patients and diabetic patients, and why is it that they're so vulnerable? So, you know, I think all of you know at this point that, uh, you know, ACE2 is the receptor in our cells that's responsible for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 being able to get into the human cells. So we had data from our collaborators, Matthias uh, Kressler's group in Michigan and others, looking at patients with diabetic kidney disease and cell-specific RNA-seq data for their kidneys. Now, what is really important is, and this is on here, this was done before there was COVID, right? So no SARS-CoV-2, no nothing. This is literally what do kidneys look like? And in this case, you know, we actually used this data to identify the specific cell type that was ACE2 plus expressing that was responsible for SARS-CoV-2 being able to get into the kidneys, right? So if we look just at that cell type, what do the kidneys of these patients look like? So it's PTEX, for those of you who are um, no kidney biologists, so it's, um, they're PTEX, the DKD PTEX, and now we're projecting them onto the networks, the kidney-specific tissue-specific networks that I've just told you about that know nothing again about this. And then on the left, we have information of ACE2 plus signature, same cell type from patients in the hospital that don't have diabetes, but have severe COVID. And so we're filtering those cells from their urine, the same PTEX, and we're looking at the expression of that same cell type in those patients. And again, projecting it onto the kidney network. And what we see is actually the same module, basically. You can see that all this viral stuff, interferon, right, like inflammation, in these DKD ACE2 plus PTEX who are not actually going through any infection. So essentially the hypothesis that this really shows, and we see that same module here in the patients that have severe COVID in the hospital that don't have diabetes. So essentially the hypothesis is that the PTEX, ACE2 plus PTEX cells, like the specific cells that are responsible for ACE2, for the um, SARS-CoV-2 getting into the cells in our kidneys, are actually primed in diabetic patients. They look sort of like infected cells from COVID. So they're primed for the viral entry. And that may actually explain why these patients are so vulnerable to COVID. This was actually very important because this was a year ago when everyone was wondering whether we should 
uh, take all of the patients that are hypertensive off of ACE plus, uh, ACE2 inhibitors, right? And so this and another uh, paper at the time were two like really early papers that showed that no, 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 it has nothing to do with that. It's really something about the state of the cells uh, that's inherent and not about the hypertension medication. And so, you know, you can actually do all of these analysis in our human base, humanbase.io. So you can look at all of these networks. You can actually, you know, for computational folks here, of course, you guys can actually download any of these networks. You do your own analysis, but you can also do all of these, these visualization. You can do these functional module discovery that I just showed recently, as well as actually look at the predicted impacts of transcriptional and post-transcriptional variants. You can upload your own variants that will make your predictions uh, and allow you to uh, download them. And uh, also our open source uh, deep learning libraries for biological sequences, well, is open source, so <laughs> we'll be very happy for people to use it. Um, and finally, I don't actually do anything useful anymore. Like, I just go around and give talks and uh, uh, enjoy hanging out with everyone, but it's really my amazing group that's uh, done all the work. I think throughout, I've acknowledged people who did the work, but this is the entire group. I don't think I had a chance to acknowledge the incredible human-based team, so Aaron Wong is really the project lead of that uh, human-based project, really the one who makes it all happen in his group of software engineers. Uh, and thank you very much. I would love to have some questions. So the, the, the cell-specific networks and tissues are really fascinating. And I was wondering if you could just give a summary of like, how different are cell-specific networks? Like, should I think 80% the same or 20% the same? Uh, because like, for lazy people like me, I would prefer to, pers per I would prefer to assume that they're all the same. Uh, your work has shown clearly that they're not. Yep. But I, I, I want some rules of thumb for how different these tissue-specific networks are. It's a really good question. And uh, I don't have a percent. <laughs> because of course, like, you know, percent is not as relevant because a huge fraction of them are very low. Right. You know, it, everything has a connection, right? It's a fully connected weighted graph, and the vast majority of connections are at very low, pro they're basically not happening. Uh, and of course, it depends on how, what we have actually looked quite a bit, and you can literally recon reconstruct the sort of tissue hierarchies out of just network similarities. So they are pretty different if you take very different cell types, and yet you do find similarities if you look at cell types that are either, sim like for example, if you look at epithelial cells, across different organs, there's a lot of similarities, but you do see differences. Yeah. And then, of course, different lung cells, for example, will also have similarities, but also some differences. Um, we do find that, you know, just like in that study where, you know, the blood, um, uh, the blood network, right, that uh, one, one of the checks we actually do, it's a really good question, we really try to look at, do we find cell type and tissue specific signal? Right, because you can just run the same analysis on Exactly, so we'll do, right, different. like, so one of the, you know, we do all of these, you know, and this is actually, I think, important for the students, right, uh, as or postdocs, as you're thinking about this, is right, like, in addition to all the standard evaluations, we're obsessive, right, like, and you have to be careful, and obviously the standard machine learning careful of, like, holdouts, not just cross-validations, et cetera, et cetera. We always do sort of complementary evaluations, right, something that we didn't train for at all. So for this, the obvious one is, can you predict disease genes, right? Like, so we will always do that, and then that next question is, like, are disease genes for diseases that are happening in that tissue, you know, that's a complicated, but, you know, at least on the gut check, are they, is your network for, like if you're looking at diabetic kidney disease, your kidney networks better be more accurate than your, I don't know, brain or liver networks, right? And if you're not getting, and ideally if you know the cell type, that would be even better, right? Like is that cell type? So that's a really good check. And we do do that and they are different. I know I'm not giving no, you a that's, percent. Well, that's the kind of thing I was wondering. Hey Olga, Jonathan hey. Sabat, UCSD. Great talk as always. So I, uh, I'm intrigued by the, the idea of the, the cell type specific genetic networks in autism specifically. And uh, so uh, one thing that we found really remarkable in our latest preprint was the, which the last figure is not in the preprint <laughs> yet, but it's the cell type specificity of exome protein coding variants in autism compared to non-coding variants from GWAS. And what we found was that, is that there's a huge cell type specificity to all the protein coding variants. Uh, they're highly enriched in excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But GWAS associations, when tied to individual genes, very little cell type specificity at all, which might make sense, 
in the sense that, that protein coding genes, protein coding variants and probably uh, UTR variants are mm -hmm. tied to the gene, to the gene level. And the cell type specificity of the gene matters yeah. for UTR and protein coding variants. But when you're tied to an enhancer, it doesn't matter what's going on at the gene level. It matters what's going on at the enhancer. And so I wonder, have you looked at the difference between your RNA-seq cell type specificity data and your attack seq enhancer data? And do you see a difference between the cell type specificity patterns at the regulatory element versus the gene? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I love your guys' work, by the way. But yes, so um, not exactly that study, but we have looked. So I actually, I have a slightly different, well, let me answer, and then I'll, I'll give you a hypothesis back. I wonder if it's a difference between common versus rare or all, right? Like, so what we do see, I don't have like cell type specificity all the way to that resolution, but we have looked at, you know, because we have those models, we, you know, what I'm showing you is actually all the, all the, you know, I said we have cell type specific models, et cetera, but honestly, like it's such a hard game, as you know, in the regulatory variants to get enough power that then we integrate all of this and those, you know, the graphs that I've showed for autism are actually all of these models giving you one score. Mm -hmm. But then you can actually go back to the, you know, you can throw out all the tissue culture and just look at the, you know, tissue specific models, right? Like that are actually where it works trained on the data from post-mortem actual tissue samples. And then you can map where you see the biggest difference between the probands and siblings. Right. And it turns out there, um, and I don't want to misquote, but basically I think all but one are, like all the top ones are brain right. and embryonic, right? Like, so you do see at least- that, That's at the variant level or at the gene that's level? A, so that's the, you know, you're, you're looking at each variant and then integrating across all the variants, like basically just the, where you have the biggest difference between dysregulate, uh, you know, proband versus sibling dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And there you do see a, you know, it's definitely the brain, but of course that's not cell type specific. It's just, right. you know, sort of whatever they had. Basically the resolution is as uh, mm -hmm. non-specific. I think there were 10 different like brain, various regions of the brain mm -hmm. uh, and embryonic goes up. And we do see also a similar pattern in the RBP data as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wonder, I wonder if some of it is like common versus, right? Like, because it may be that common variants are indeed like sort of these more broader and, but I don't know for sure. Or it may just be that we don't have quite enough data. Or they're, it not should be tissue or they're, and they're not regulating at the level of the individual gene. Oh yeah, exactly. They're that regulating could be, at a large scale. Yes, overall, scale exactly. Scale that could level. totally be it. Yeah. Exactly, okay. exactly. Hi, Olga. Hi. Hi, nice talk as always. Thanks, uh, I'm Quaid Morris, uh, for the rest of the people who don't know who I am. Um, this, I, I, we're very interested in Seq Weaver, and as, as you know, I'm very interested in RNA binding proteins in general. And, and a lot of the proteins that are coming up as, as the things that, both on your slides and your paper, as the major factors are like, not, some of them are sequence specific, but they're, they're core members of the splicing machinery, and there's things like UPF1, which is like not even sequence specific, but marks splicing boundaries. I'm wondering if, uh, have you tried uh, training Seq Weaver using like also annotations as some of your outputs as well? It, like perhaps some of these RNA binding proteins are just surrogates for for specific like splice sites and and three uh, three prime. Yeah, jars. that's a really good point. We do find. I mean, one is we do actually find uh, a number of these. You know, the ones I highlight are sort of the better study because I want to be able to then compare them, right? Like to something like the coding variant effects, and so that selects for them. We do find quite a few that are actually quite sequence specific, and uh, um, you know, ones that are not just affecting splicing but affecting you know, other parts of the uh, RNA metabolism. We've looked at a number of different, like in addition to CLIP, looking at other uh, types of data. And it, uh, you know, basically, it's a trade-off, right? Like we ended up uh, deciding to just limit it to CLIP because the accuracy, when we compare to in vivo, seemed to be lower. Okay. But that said, I think in the long run, we probably will have to make it more broader and just decide that we're going to be very careful in how we evaluate and be able to include like more of this information, right? But the, you know, we haven't looked at it recently. In the beginning when we did, Chris did actually a pretty careful study of how we can look at different types of data. And it did look like just limiting it to CLIP gave you a lot more accuracy if you define accuracy as like in vivo, um, ability to predict in vivo outcomes. So, you know, 
It, that's why we made that decision. But I don't know if it's a hard and fast decision long term. Okay. Thanks a lot, Olga. No worries. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, let's thank Olga for <laughs> a great keynote. We now.